Hey, everyone. How's it going? Good evening. It is time. And when I say time, I mean right about time that we get started with this because uh, technology always puts a little bit of a, a needle in your eye when you're trying something new. Uh, that's right always the more now? fun. Yeah. Like this right about now. Brother? Yeah, for real. Okay. Um, and uh, fashionably late. Yeah, fashionably late. Yeah, I think within the, the 20 minutes time, it only took, uh, what, 20 plus minutes just to get into the game, even though we were supposed to start at 9.15. But hey, you know what? That's okay. Because we're going to have a hell of a time tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, uh, before we say anything, first of all, happy Halloween. To our viewers at home and those watching on YouTube, this, of course, is uh, our new campaign. Uh, appropriately timed, I guess, uh, uh, as we are starting off the spooky season, right? Uh, with the Ravenloft campaign. And we have our four players here tonight who are ready to start off a new, cool new D&D campaign. Um... And uh, this is going to be a, a different undertaking, I think, from our, our previous couple campaigns. Uh, much more sort of role-playing uh, based. Not to say that there won't be, you know, other things. Hijinks, uh, combat shenanigans, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but you'll find the flavor, so to speak, of Ravenloft very present um, in the sessions that we have here in this campaign. Um, so I hope that you'll come along with us for this journey. Um, before we go into the rules, I want to introduce our players, some of whom you know, some of whom you may not necessarily be familiar with. So I will introduce you all tonight to our roster of players before we go into characters. Don't tell anybody what your characters are quite yet, folks, because we're going to talk about them <laughs> uh, very shortly. So let's go ahead and start with... Um, uh, with this gentleman to my right. Um, Alex, go ahead and tell us about you, please. I'm Alex. What do you, what do you, what do you want me to say? I don't know, man. Just introduce, introduce everyone to you. Like, what do you do on the internet? Where can you be found? Why, why do you like D&D? &D? Oh, that thing. I love, I love role-playing games. I've loved role-playing games since I was um, in junior high school. I started with AD&D 2nd Edition. So that's what brought me back. I'm really nowhere to be found on the internet. Like I don't, I don't do social media much. I'm not, I'm not big on it. I tried. So I mean, you guys can find me at Instagram at underscore Alex underscore Lorenzo until Matt decides to start posting for me. <laughs> on Instagram. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Okay, moving on down. Um, under Alex, we have Maeve. Hey, hi, Maeve. Uh, you can find me at Maeve Clymer on Twitter, and I draw art. Some of it is the spicy variety, but that's okay. So I have been doing roleplay for a while, but I haven't really been doing D&D that long. Uh, this is kind of a new undertaking. I've never streamed before, and I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, Maeve. All right. Uh, moving on over uh, to... These folks over here on the on the left of me. Um, let's start with let's start with Red. Red, go ahead and tell us a little about you and and your experience in role playing. Um, hi, I'm Red. Um, I only recently rarely got into um, D and D because I never knew it was a thing until I watched Critical Role, and then I watched Critical Role, and I was searching around for some games I could play, and I stumbled across Slice and Dices, and then I've just been with them for about just over a year now and now i'm finally back in the game so still pretty new to this whole D D thing thing but well we'll see what happens super thank you sir um and then finally uh the lady uh, to my left on the screen sarah where can people find you and what do you what do you want to tell all of our illustrious guests hello i'm sarah you've seen me here for the last two and a half years as we finished up <laughs> <laughs> the truly epically long Dungeon the Bad Mage campaign, which was actually my first D&D &D campaign. Uh, I always wanted to play role-playing games, but like in high school, the boy, my boyfriend and his friends wouldn't let the girls play, which is dumb, but whatever. 
uh, my first tabletop role playing game was Fiasco for my 30th birthday. And uh, then I started out with Pathfinder first edition and then started playing 5e with these guys right here. Uh, and I love it. And it's awesome. Uh, and you can find me on the internet, on Twitter, on Instagram, at Lovely Llama, where I don't post a lot, but I am getting a new tattoo tomorrow, so there will definitely be pictures of that coming. Awesome. Hey. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Matt. I'm the DM here every once in a while, and um, I enjoy uh, streaming as much as I can when technology doesn't poop on my face um and he's wearing uh, a really cool shirt tonight i like your shirt you like you like the shirt i thought it, it would looks, be appropriate I like, to have I like sort the, of I like the collar look like the, the little mandarin collar, collar thing happening yeah. and it looks very comfy yeah it is uh it, it is uh the fall season no more yeah. no more with the with the warm weather it is quite chilly and and uh weather uh is is very much cooperating it is it is just raining and gloomy and foggy tonight windy. here i have yeah i have windy. what i call oh my, my grandpa flannel on hand for when it gets cold in here it's a chilly we night it's a, a night you might want lid on our garbage can good god oh, shit. where did it go i don't know oh my god already spooky spooky shit um it's a good night to <laughs> curl up with a mug of mulled wine maybe or beer Warm fire. Nice dwarven flagon. Is this one? I hope it is. Um, but uh, uh, you in chat. Hey, awesome! Thank you guys for joining us. Let's let's talk about what um what role do you play? Because besides uh, throwing uh, an amazing list of uh, of cool stuff us here in chat, and, and uh, thank you for the subs. You guys are awesome, and you guys can can participate in our lovely little campaign. Not so much in the same way that you probably are used to, uh, but to some degree, uh, it still injects a little bit of chaos, a little bit of um, choice, shall we say, uh, to our players. And um, here's, this, here's how this works. There will be a time uh, where you will be able to use your channel points to make the players do one of two things. The first, which will cost 2,500 points um, is something called Tempt the Fates. You can take a look down there if you're looking on your channel points on all the things that you can do with D&D. Um, tempting the Fates for these players basically allows them to offer a boon to whomever you choose to give this boon to, but at a price if it is chosen. We will be using something called appropriately for Ravenloft, the Taroka deck. Uh, in Roll20, you can use all kinds of card decks, and this is no different. So the Taroka deck will be used for this particular uh, functionality with chat. And what Tempt the Fates does is a specific card will be drawn at random from the common Taroka deck, which is the lower 40 cards of the 54 card deck. That common card will be given to the player to give them a boon if they have chosen to do so. That boon is a relatively minor or moderate one, which they will keep for as long as the card dictates. But once it is used, if they are chosen, that card becomes cursed and is brought back into the deck and of course shuffled again. The next time that card is chosen based on Tempt the Fates, the cursed version of that card will activate as they have chosen their fate. That you will see the results of if you choose to do so tonight. I don't want a whole lot of that going on. So um, that will be uh, limited to three per session if you just so cho uh, choose to, to use those. And I would also prefer that if chat were to use them, that they use them at preferably dramatic moments, not places where they just want to, you know, eh, let's fuck with the players. No, let's let's keep this on on target with with the kind of tone that we want to have. Um and the card is not a physical representation of the card. It comes to them um in the way that all dark powers of this particular plane do in dreams and visions. 
So that's tempt the fates, folks. The other way that you can use your chat points, your channel points, is much, much more expensive. This is only going to happen once a game at most, and it will cost 10,000 channel points. This is something called the Dark Powers Speak. What does this mean? Well, we still have 14 cards left. We have the common deck, which is the 40, and then the other 14, which is called the High Taroka deck. The High Taroka deck are very powerful cards, and there are only 14 of them. Once these are drawn, there's no going back. These cards will give no choice to the player, but something very important, good or ill, will occur. And the ramifications of that will, of course, have to be dealt with. So that's the way that will work. Again, only one per session at most for the Dark Powers Speak. Uh, we're working with a couple of other optional rules, including the Taroga deck, which I think you may find scattered throughout the campaign, uh, but more to come. Anywho, time to get into the business of tonight's session, which is uh, entitled Episode 1, The Mists. Hmm, wonder why. As we begin, we see... A, well, a plane of absolute gray, undulating fog. I'll give you a little bit of mood music, shall I? Here we go. Okay. There we go. Through the fog, we see a desiccated landscape with rotten, gnarled trees. And our vision slowly moves through this landscape. To the edge of a village. This village is little more than huts made of wood and thatch. And no one is on the street, nor would they dare to be at this time of night. The moon, pale and gibbous, its halo white and uh, almost pregnant with some kind of evil uh, essence to it that you could almost taste, you could almost smell it in the air, shines down on this village. And the only lights that we see come from a single building at the center of this village. And these lights are waning. They seem to come from candles, perhaps half burnt down within this building. And very little sound other than the sound of that fire comes from inside. The door opens, and out staggers a young man, drink in hand. He has a, a bottle of some kind of red liquid. He is pale, he has dark hair, uh, dark eyes, a stubble around his chin, and walks in a fashion that seems to indicate that he comes from some kind of upbringing that is other than that of a peasant. He looks down at the bottle, looks up at the moon, looks out 
at the vestiges of this village and the gray mists undulating around it sort of spits on the ground and then takes the bottle and just pours out this red liquid onto the ground and tosses the bottle off to the side into the dirt where it lands with a crash. Half dazed with uh, fatigue, perhaps, or some other kind of malaise, he looks out into the fog and walks slowly, methodically into it, as if nothing in it or out of it would ever harm him. We'll get back to him in a bit. In another place, in another time, we are now no longer in this gray mist. We are now, well, we are now underwater, actually. We see the dark liquid of this place and shapes, fish, large and small, float before our vision. We see dark green kelp floating to and fro and pale, craggy reefs of coral on the base of this aquatic landscape. And before our vision, a shape out of the darkness of that water visualizes in front of us. This is a shape that from the waist up is that of a young woman with long tresses of hair that float behind her in the water. But from the waist down, she is piscined or piscine. She has fins and instead of legs, a long tail like appendage, which she uses to push strongly through the water. Her hands have some kind of a, a, a fibrous webbing in between its fingers, in their, in between their fingers, and her nails are long and sharp and her eyes are completely black. She jets through the water with ease, able to see things in this darkness that we cannot. And as we see her, her face squints at something just beyond our vision that we cannot see. She sees a cave, a place that in her long existence of this underwater paradise, she has never, ever experienced. Curious? She floats and then swims at a pace directly towards this cave and sees that there is in fact a way through and up into perhaps an area of this cave that has air to it. But it matters not to her. She is able to breathe under the water as well as above it, although she prefers to be under the water. She surfaces under this cave and finds herself at the shore of an underwater grotto. She looks around and with her vision is able to spy that this underwater grotto is quite vast and has magnanimous stalactites and stalagmites growing out of its um, uh, out of uh, out of its top and bottom levels, and she is able to sort of pad her way up onto the shore of this cave because she sees something within that she is not quite sure what to make of. She sees a 
fire. Fire for her is something that she instinctively is quite afraid of. It is the opposite of her nature. But on this fire, ghostly in nature and green, she sees an object, a large iron cauldron with a lid atop it. Even more curious and not fearful in the least, she moves towards this receptacle, this vessel. It gives off no heat, only light, and she wanders towards it. As she nears this cauldron, the top slides off of it, and a filmy, scaled arm comes out of it atop it. She instinctively moves away. What is this that could survive inside such an awful thing? But as she moves away, she feels instinctively drawn towards this hand and whatever it is attached to. A face, a gleaming yellow eye within as it beckons her towards being in the pot. As she comes within an arm's length, the arm reaches out and snatches her by the arm, and within a voice, wretched, grotesque, saying, Yes, you do, you do And then her vision turns to gray. And the sounds of the burbling water end. We'll get back to her as well in just a moment. Another scene visualizes this in a forest at midday or just about dusk, we see a young woman, tall, with golden orange locks and a, a hood over her face, um, perhaps shielding it from others. She wears an accoutrement of weapons and uh, a, a a uh, cuirass of leather armor over her. She's clearly outfitted to bear. And she walks amongst two other individuals, also similarly laden. She walks into the forest with a look of determination on her face, yet not saying a word. She spies something on the edge of her vision and makes a hand motion. One of her compatriots peels off and pulls something out of their leather satchel, giving the woman a nod. The other two move further into the dark wood, and another movement, this one quick, in front of them. Between two trees seems to spur on the two remaining hunters of whatever this creature is. The woman knocks her crossbow and takes the arrow and pricks her thumb with it, spilling a tiny drop of blood onto its tip. She then puts the arrow back into the crossbow and motions to her other compatriot to move off to the left into what seems to be an ever-growing and strangely thick patch of fog that has come into this place. And as this woman moves into the wood, searching for her quarry, she looks around 
expecting this being, this entity, this creature, whatever that is, to come down on her at any moment. All she hears is the fluttering of wings, crows most likely, or ravens as they are called in her area of the world. And then she calls out to the names of her compatriots. She says, Talia? Giselle? There is no reply. She mutters under her breath and says, Oh, you're good, Evelyn. You're really good. And then continues to stalk her prey through the fog and shrouded woods until the mists cover her completely. And we'll get back to her as well in a moment. The last scene, the last of our quartet, shall we say, starts in a place most foul. It starts in a chamber, but not a chamber that you would ever want to be trapped or placed into. This chamber is stone from floor to ceiling and is festooned with an array of strange and deadly-looking devices. Some of a nature that members of this party or of this world would probably have never encountered before. They are metal and have strange knobs and buttons on them. Arcs of electricity pass through them. A nearby table has glasses, vials with strange colored liquid, the remnants of dead animals placed haphazardly upon them. And nearby to this strange scattered mess of detritus and machines is a wooden table placed directly in the center of this chamber. And the being on this table wakes with a gasp <gasps> and coughs, looks down at their hand, covered in strange, sodden bandages with insects zipping to and fro around him. He waves them away and then realizes that his depth perception is, is off. He, he cannot see. He puts his hand up to his eyes and finds that one of his eyes is covered as well with this strange bandage. He looks down. His body is torn limb from limb, but then placed back together. He cannot remember who, who is he? What, what is his, what is his name? Where is he from? What have they done to him? Who are they? Noises around him alert him that there is someone else, either in this chamber or nearby, and he quickly hides under the table that he was positioned on and moves swiftly to a nearby doorway. He opens the door and sees a long hallway coated in a strange gray mist, as if mist were undulating from outside, from some perhaps courtyard or forest. And yet he feels no wind. He sees no light, just this gray mist. One of the machines on the table buzzes and chirps, and he realizes that whatever, whoever has made him this way, 
most likely searching for him. He must get out. He must. He must leave this place. And he hobbles, grabbing a, a nearby table for support. And doing so, the table snaps in half from his weight. And he grabs a table leg as if it were a crush or a cane and uses it to path his way forward into the gray mist. And now that scene fades to a close. We have discovered our four players in this particular game. And now I will introduce you to them one by one. Let's start with the first of our four. Let's start with Claudio. Claudio. As you path through the mist, you see nothing. You have, of course, been brought up in the town of Barovia, so you know of the mist. You know, of course, as well, that those who come from the mist or go into the mist are usually not ones that you would want to deal with or have heard from ever again. Nor would you want to ever experience those who betray the Count, Count von Zarevich, as he deals with his particular prey in a much less pleasant way, shall we say. Claudio, as you walk through the mist, you find yourself now no longer in the village. You find yourself on a long stretch of road bordered by trees. We obviously no longer have the bottle, which you were attempting to use to find some semblance of humanity in, but people like you don't necessarily find humanity any longer, do they? Or at least not the kind that you were used to. It is then, Claudio, that you see before you a young woman. Uh, let's actually, let me show everyone what Claudio looks like. You okay there, now? There we go. There's Claudio. Uh, yeah. Claudio, um, you see on the corner of your vision, coming out of the trees, uh, a young woman, perhaps, uh, you can only guess that by her, uh, her raiment and her cloak billowing around her, and she carries a very vicious-looking crossbow. She has, um, orange hair, uh, perhaps reddish, and yeah, let's let's talk about uh, Amnestria. Amnestria. As you stalk your way through the forest, you were almost positive that you had your quarry in your sights. But no longer. You are in a totally different place. The air feels different. It smells different. It tastes different. You're no longer in Mordent. You are someplace else. And in your keen vision, you spy someone upon the road. A young man, dressed in gray, very pale, very pale skin. You're free to say hello, if you'd like. Hello there. Uh, what's your name? Uh, my name is Anistria. Where are we? I don't remember being near this road. Interesting. I was about to ask you the same question. You see, I walk through the fog. 
And now I feel like I need a drink and maybe that was a bad idea. I'm guessing you walked through the fog as well. Yes, you could say that. It's not unusual for me to venture into dark places. Well, maybe I should go back to Barovia. Where did you come from? Well, I... Did I come from... Uh, where is Barovia? That's an interesting dilemma. You see, I... I got slightly depressed and I walked into the fog. Which is a bad idea. Terrible idea, really. And now I fear that I've sobered up and realized the error of my ways. So... The truth is, I do not know where Barovia is. Oh. You know where Barovia isn't? Not here. Well, maybe I can help you find just where you need to go. Sounds good. First things first, though. Have you stumbled onto a tavern? Not today. Hmm. And so, Claudio uh, eyes the road. Uh, it seems to it seems to go on quite a while, actually, in this mist. Forward and backward. Oh, you look backward Claudio. to where where you, where you came specifically, where you came through the mist. It just seems to sort of be enveloped by it. So I'm still in the mist? We're still in the mist? I mean, it's around you. You see the shapes of trees. It's much thicker the way you came, that's for certain. Just we walk, um, in a direction. Do you have a suggestion which direction we should walk in? Hmm. Let's flip a coin. Heads, we walk north. Tails, we walk south. I will roll okay. 1d2. Okay. Looks like we're going south. Okay. Which Very way cool. is south? <laughs> <laughs> well, south... Which way south is? You could you could make if you would like. Um, Nestria, you wouldn't know naturally because you've never. I mean, you look at this place; it's totally different from where you were before. You would probably be able to if you could see the stars. You could probably tell, probably tell where where star where south is. Um, maybe, either by doing a nature check or a survival check, you could sort of take a look at maybe some of the trees and determine based on the position of the sun. Maybe. Moss grows on the south side, I believe, of trees, from what I remember. I'd like to do a nature check. Sure. Strange. Very strange, Amnistria. Moss is growing all over these trees. Not in a specific side of them. Almost as if... Well, it's almost as if the sun doesn't really pick a side. Hmm. Well, in that case, I'll just spin around and point in a direction. And Claudio spins around. <laughs> and then he stops and um, he's pointing sort of off, but in a direction. Would you care to join me? What was your name? My name is... Amnestria. Amnestria. Amnestria or Amnestria? Amnestria. Amnestria. You can simply call me Rhea, if you Rhea. wish. Rhea works. Um, I am Claudio, UNESCO, of Barovia. Is Claudio fine? You can call me Claude. 
Let's that it is. Go in this direction that I. Hopefully it's south. Hopefully it's north. Hopefully we bump into a tavern. And so. Okay. And the two of you walk in a direction that seems to be the correct one. All the while, the road maybe staying within sight of the road? Along the road? Hopefully. Maybe the road leads someplace somewhat habitable. We shall see. Our friend diminutive though he may be and that is the gray skinned well maybe he was at one point some form of a gnome but now well what is mikbik who knows really mikmik after staggering through that long tunnel and into this mist, you felt like you were outside for a second, but now you're not quite sure. Everything is cold, and you're feeling, well, in this form, whatever that is. It's very hard to feel things in the way that you used to, whenever that was. All you remember is your name. Or maybe that was your name or something like it. You're not quite sure. Uh, thank God you grabbed this table leg because your body, it's not really responding very well. But you notice now that you look under your bare feet because you basically are just wearing rags and that's it and you no longer see the stone cobblestones which you could feel cold and clammy under you. You now see that these stone cobblestones have turned to gravel and leaves and you are amidst trees, large, black, gnarled trees whose branches reach out to you. And your size being what it is, these trees, enormous already, are titans looking to engulf you. And it is then that you spy someone on the road. Uh, you're not quite sure who they are, whether it's a male or a female. Um... You seem to be about maybe 30 or 40 paces from them. Uh, and they are walking along the road. And they stop. Cock their head. And, and from this distance, you can sort of squint and make out their features. It seems to be a man. This man is wearing sort of drab attire. Sort of a long shift. And you see on his back, he's wearing some thing. It looks like maybe it's a some kind of a musical instrument. You're not quite sure what. Very strange. You can only assume that because it has tuning pins in it and long strings. And he cocks his head again. And he calls out in a language that you think you can understand. He says, Hello? Hello, is someone there? And from this strange, quiet bleakness, you hear a strange voice. And this voice seems to sing. Your eyes and your vision begin to swim. You feel sort of inexorably drawn to this unearthly voice. 
It's a beautiful, haunting song in a language you don't quite understand at all, but you understand the tenor of this beautiful, strange song. And you want, naturally, just to, to walk towards it, as does this figure that you are watching. He drops all of his material possessions on the ground before him and walks towards the source of this song and puts out his hand towards a figure just beyond the range of your vision. A long, lithe figure with draped hair over their face and a long, thin, pale arm stretching out before them. It is then that this figure, within arm's reach of this man, ends her song and says a brief statement. By all means, moon not, moy not, I'm sorry, uh, feel free to speak. Yes, you will do. And then what occurs, Moynot? She reaches out a hand gently, caresses the side of his face, and snaps his neck. Mick Mick, you hear this enormous crack as the figure in the woods grabs this man and with a swift stroke with her hand around his neck you just see his head go off on an unnatural angle <gasps> and soundlessly the body drops to the ground so Mick Mick still using the um, table leg as a makeshift walking cane he'll just grab it with his second hand and even though he's ha still having troubles barely standing he'll just hold it in front of him in case the this lady who drew him over with her song goes for him okay why not? Please. Yeah, go ahead, oh, please. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I was going to say, um, after your quarry has been bested, all of his material possessions are on the ground in front of him. Yeah. Uh, as she steps out of the shadows, you see that this tall, willowy woman, at first you think she's wearing some sort of cloak, but then you realize that it is just long, dark hair that falls past her knees. And other than that, she is completely naked, except for a tiny gleam of silver around her neck. And she completely ignores you as she walks past the dead man to his possessions on the ground, uh, begins rifling through them. She finds among them uh, some wrapped up leather armor that she begins to don. Uh, she starts picking up his weapons and strapping them to her waist. She takes a lyre that was strapped to his back and straps it to her own. Uh, and once she has completely availed herself of everything this man had in his possession, uh, she sort of looks up, maybe glances at you for a second, smiles a little bit, and then just turns and begins walking down the road. What do you do, Mick Mick? Well, I mean, as soon as uh, he sees that Moynot is completely starkest, he'll be the, do the gentleman thing and just look away so to give her that privacy she, until she gets um, all suited back up again. He won't uh, really be worrying that he's just 
she's just pillaging off a a dead guy's stuff, if you will. But thing is, he, he thinks she knows where she is. He'll be slowly tailing her, just following her, seeing if she knows where she needs to go, and maybe where he needs to go. Okay. How far back do you stay, Mick Mick? Uh, probably about 30 feet. All right. Can I make a check to see if I know that he's following me? Yeah, make a, I was going to say, make a perception check. That'd be great. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I don't think your, your sights are necessarily, you know... Perhaps. I mean, I could roll a stealth and see no. if I get lower I mean, I, than roll, that. I rolled a six. I don't yeah. think you need to. <laughs> I think at, at this point, if you decided that you wanted to sort of check out where he was hiding, maybe the mists obscure him a, a bit. Maybe the the I road that the beckons you. Not yeah. a threat. Yeah. Maybe it's not worth your time. Not terribly concerned about the small one. No. Totally understood. Um, She's just walking purposefully down the road. Yeah. So, <laughs> let me avail you of a couple things. First of all, the four of you, no matter what direction you walk, south, east, west, north, along the road, beside it. You are aware of the fact that it is cold, dark. The mist is ever-present. You're not even sure if it's day or night. If it were night, perhaps the mist would be less brilliant. If it were day, Maybe you wouldn't feel so cold, but you do not know or recognize where you are. Even those of you who have some knowledge of your surroundings and or of the place that you grew up in. Um, the four of us are not walking together. It's no, just... two and two. Oh, okay. That is two correct. Not yet, anyway. Not yet. <laughs> exactly. And who knows if you ever will. Um, but... It is about ten minutes as you have walked along the road that each of you, in your mind, not so much hearing it in your ears, whether you be talking to your companion or ignoring them or following them, um, you hear a voice. Um, we'll start with Claudio as to what this voice says. Uh, Claudio, the voice says, Reclaim, reclaim, reclaim what you have lost. You have Follow the road. Amnestria. Yes, in which direction should I follow that road? Amnestria, you hear Claudius speaking out loud, as if he has just been told something by you. And just as you're about to question him as to that, you yourself hear a voice in your head that says, Your quarry, your quarry is within your grasp. Follow the, road. Follow the road. And perhaps that answers your question. Hmm. Muy not, you as well hear a voice in your mind that says, Defeat the one, Defeat the one. Defeat the one. who has made you what you made are. You what you made you. Follow the road. Follow the road. This spurs you. Yeah, I was gonna say. 
You maybe grasp the necklace around your neck absentmindedly. And Mick Mick, you hear a voice that also echoes in your mind that says, Remember who you are. Find your true self. Follow the road. Okay, so it'll be still following Moynat, but seeing as Moynat is on the road, he'll be following the road as well. The cryptic message that you've all received seems to spur you in a specific direction. And it doesn't take long before you are led, perhaps of your own initiative or of that of something else, uh, from this place to where the, the road itself actually seems to be more disused and turns more overgrown by weeds and the roots of spindly trees nearby. And as the four of you walk two by two, a light rain, more of a drizzle, begins to fall as you travel. For you, Moynat, this is the first feel of moisture on your skin since you have been on this place except for this ever-present mist. How does it make you feel? Stronger. So it's I'm not seawater. No, but I turn my face up for a brief moment to sort of let it wash over me and feel it running through my hair. And I continue forward. Claudio and Amnestria, it also begins to rain upon you. I don't quite know how you react to that. Oh, it's rain. Amnestria would simply pull her cloak in a little bit just to try to keep her crossbow underneath it, but just to try to also stay a little drier. Mick, Mick. Oh, no, go ahead, walking? Claudio. Sorry, go ahead. How long have you been walking? You know, that's a really great question. Um, it certainly has been more than perhaps 10, 15 minutes, maybe longer. Time's strange. You feel like you were walking for about maybe half an hour, but then you sort of look back to see the road that you've traveled on, and it has been engulfed by the mist. 50 yards back, you can see nothing but white and gray. Mick, Mick, it does begin to rain on you as well, and your bandages become sodden, somewhat heavy and slip, slippery, more slick. Well, even more so. Yeah. What's under them, you have no idea. Unless you've taken a look. Well, not since Rebirth, he knows what's under there. You look, and you're able to spy through the gray of this place. You see Muinat's hair sort of coming down, and she just lifts her head, positions her face in the the drizzling rain. Make a perception check, Mick Mick. Okay. Simple perception? Yeah. Simple perception, yeah. Simple perception. Where are we? Perception. That one. Well, yeah, you're not quite sure. But, I mean, she is clothed now. She's worn something that her unfortunate victim seems to have donated to her. To her. She wears his instrument as well. But from her knees down, she is barefoot. You're not quite sure. You could swear this. Something odd about her skin. 
doesn't seem like, well, like any scene you've seen. That's all for now. I should also mention that coming out from her hair, there is a crown of blue horns. Hmm. That almost look like ocean waves. Oh, neat. Like that. As the four of you, not within sight of each other, except your particular pairs, approach a point in the road, it seems to be some kind of a, a crossroads, as the road that you travel on is bisected by another road. But the thing that makes you stop in your tracks is that there is a figure in the middle of this crossroads, which the leaden rain makes this, fo this form cloaked in a dark, black cloak seem all the more unreal, unmoving, its face hidden in the shrouds of its cloak. You don't see one another at this point, just the pairs of each other. How do you react to this mysterious black cloaked figure? My hand goes immediately to the weapons at my hips. But I also continue walking forward purposefully. Excuse me, sir. Uh, would you happen to be able to point me in the direction of a tavern? The figure says nothing. Oh, that's You really want a drink, don't you? I'm also getting hungry. You Whoa, could swear, this... Moynat and Mikmik, that you could hear a, a voice coming from the further down the road. Uh, uh, perhaps a. Not quite sure what it would say, uh, but uh, something coming out of the mist on the other side of this figure. I am unconcerned. I walk directly towards it. When you get within about 10 feet of this figure, the head of this figure snaps up, glaring at you with yellow, piercing eyes. What you took for a cloak spreads out around it, revealing itself to be a pair of mighty black wings. And with one powerful motion and a blast of chill air, <laughs> The wings sweep, and the vague figure is gone. Those yellow eyes look familiar to me. I would say that they may be, although it was very swift in your seeing. So maybe not. Oh, we Matt, we've got a first redemption. Oh my god. Okay. It is time. Someone has just redeemed the dark powers speak as we spoke about in the beginning. Of course they did. Of course they did. <laughs> it's our friend Iron Wolf. Oh, hi. Hey, so, Iron. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to switch to the map view where we can see our wonderful players and where they are in the crossroads. There they are. Now we'll bring out the Taroka deck, you specifically there? the high Taroka deck. Yes, absolutely. I'll take you there. I'll take you there. Boom. You're on the crossroads. Let's bring out the Taroka deck. Here we go. So let me see if I can bring out my handy dandy Taroka guide. <laughs> now. Well, the great thing about high Taroka deck uh, drawings is that this could happen now, or this could happen at the DM's choice anywhere in the campaign. Oh, wow. Anywhere, at any time. It's stored to my use. 
All I will say is the name of the card. And we'll keep that card for later. Our high card are our high Taroka cards assigned to a character or only the low cards assigned to a character? It depends on the card. Great question. Okay. I love that. In chat, I'm a bit shy for the low Taroka one, but I was definitely thinking about it. Okay. Got some user participation, which is something I like to see. Here we go. Let's see what the high Taroka deals out. Oh, and Matt may want to um, adjust the uh, overlays for the... Because we've got, like, all people in the... The character sheet black box oh looks. that is true yes i will change that i don't know how that happened there we go fix that thank you so much yeah. it was a bit wacky thank you indian yes. fury it is fixed okay so let's talk about I what you get the back of these cards Super. oh yeah here we go. Let's deal a card out. It is... The Dungeon. Oh, dear. Uh -oh. That oh, means... Dear. If you tooltip over the Dungeon card, you'll see that the Dungeon in the Taroka means isolation and imprisonment. Being so conservative in thinking as to be a prisoner of one's own beliefs. So I will take back this card. And what it means, well, we'll figure out a good time to use the dungeon card. Maybe in the session, maybe not. Maybe we'll have two in one session, we'll see. That was from the high deck, so. That was from the high deck. That... And that's the, that's the one for the session. <laughs> All right, let's go and remove our deck and we'll come back later. Um, it is at this time after this mysterious figure that you all have seen spread Maybe its black wings. Yeah, watching. you definitely went higher. Yeah, you definitely went forward. Yeah. I would say Mick Mick was further behind, yeah. You're definitely within now, um, Amnestria and Claudio, you're definitely within sight of this figure who has now replaced this black cloaked figure in the midst of this crossroads. I'm uh, watching where the winged figure went. Can I see where he went? Make a perception check. God damn perception does not like me tonight. <laughs> Natural one, no. In fact, it's very unlikely maybe that you even see Claudio and Amnestria at this point. That's, I am focused. <laughs> Fine. Well, you're still looking at the sky. You've probably got water in your eyes. Yeah. That's it's... not really a problem. But... Yeah, for real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, he definitely didn't know the direction of a tavern. You, black cloaked figure, would you happen to know the direction of a tavern? I don't believe I do. Well, that rules out there tries to charm, I guess. It's... I... Where did you come from? Nestria would kind of look over towards the figure in the distance and be like, Does this road lead somewhere? Only to where I have come. Well, it seems we're at a bit of a crossroads, aren't we? In a... Very literal sense. Indeed. Should we go east or west? I. Did anyone see where that thing went? I. seen things like this before. My hometown, things fly and do things to people. <laughs> Sorry. That, <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's so that good. seems very 
non-descriptive. Indeed, Place you come from sounds strange. Well, suppose it is to you who hasn't been there. What is your name, black cloaked figure? Moy not. Moy not. I am Claudio Unesco of Barovia, and this here is. Uh, you can simply call me Ria. I kind of cock my head and I say, "But what is your name?" Well, my... Are you asking for my full name? Yes. Okay. Uh, my full name is Duchess Amnistria de Provolone. Amnistria, then? Yes, Amnistria is fine. I, it's, it's a mouthful, I know. No more so than why not? Mm -hmm. Mick Mick, as you hear the three of them, I like, I are you? I really, really yeah. want to call out to Mick Mick, but I don't know he's there. <laughs> yeah. That's true, you don't. <laughs> I'm just wondering if Amnestria like, does see him behind it. He would, but she doesn't know he's there. Why yeah. not? There seems to be a figure behind you. <laughs> uh, a smaller figure. Um, oh, the small one is still me. there. And then I'll turn and look. Excuse and me, sir, as soon as Mick Mick uh, sees it, Moy not turns around. He's just going to continue holding the, the table leg as an expensive stick, if you will. Not because not last time she saw, well, last time he saw Moy not turn to face somebody, their neck snapped pretty, pretty quickly. So she's like, I know what you're going to do. Don't try. <laughs> Does he say that, or is that just what his posture is saying? That's pretty much just what his posture is saying. He, so he's okay. heavily on the defensive, we'll say. Excuse me, sir. Would you know the direction of a tavern? This is the fourth time I ask. <laughs> fourth time. Make me uh, just... Um, would the mist be giving, like... Would it be harder to perceive them at this distance, through the mist? Uh, no, not any longer, strangely enough. Okay. And Nistria would simply pat Claude on the so back and be like, don't worry, we'll you, find a tavern. I was asking you, Mick Mick. Uh, Mick Mick is... I... I don't even know where I am. What is this place? That makes two of us, uh, three of us, if we kept Cloud. Does Four, anybody then. have a bottle of alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> I threw mine away in a fit of depression and walked into the mist, and I realize now that that was a terrible mistake. And now I really need a drink. Before I get hungry. There is a vast yeah, silence. <laughs> I will pay you. I have water. It's that fine. Oh. No. Well, okay. More water for me then. Bottle, She'd simply take out her flask and start drinking. You could look up at the sky and open your mouth. You could practically open your mouth and walk through the mist. Alcohol. You, sir, what's your name? I, I... It's hard to remember. I... I think it's... Mick Mick? I... Uh, it's like I've just... Woken up from a weird dream. Yeah. Small one, you seem frightened. I don't know where I am. I... I don't know how I got here. I walked through some 
missed or something, and I got here. What sent me here? I have no idea. If you don't know where you are, do you remember where you were? I don't remember much at all. I, I remember waking up on a table. Uh, these bandages were on me when I woke up. I, that, that's all I remember. And that was what, I don't even think like 15 minutes ago. Does anybody know where East and West lie? As you attempt to find out where East and West lie, or if you're on a North-South-based uh, position already, um, I'd say let, let's give you a chance to redeem her, yourself here, Muinat. Go ahead and make a perception check, please. Come on, dice. See? There you go. It all evens out. The dice give. And the dice take. And the dice take it away. <laughs> As uh, you sort of scan left and scan right along this road, you look down at the ground where this black cloaked figure once stood, and you see a small object in the road. I will kneel and pick it up. This is what you see. It is a small wooden, heart-shaped, sort of small, about yay big. It looks like a pick, except it's it's too large to be a guitar pick. It's about three or four inches long, and it's got a very uh, small hole carved right through the center with a, a, a lens or a glass film directly set into it. You also see that it's very beautifully detailed. It's got um, two crow heads or raven heads surrounded by thorns and black roses. I will curiously hold it up to my eye and look through the lens. You look through it and you see your newly found compatriots on the other side of the road. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that Moynot has absolutely, even though game, like, uh, IRL Sarah knows exactly what this is. Yeah, I'm <laughs> guessing Moynot, much like the Little Mermaid, has absolutely no fucking clue what this thing is. You've got uh, trinkets aplenty, but not this one. No, not this one. I don't think she's much of a trinket collector. That's true, yeah. I'm just going to look at it and say, well, this is... What is this? And hold it maybe up. I could, to see. Maybe I could have a look. Um, By all means. Stage school, I did drop out, but uh, <laughs> did learn a few things there. So, uh, yeah. uh, seven. Uh, you look <laughs> at it. Uh, you're not quite sure, <laughs> to be honest, Cloudy. You're drunk. <laughs> I will well, push the roll. You push the roll. Wrong system. <laughs> um, although, maybe one day. Who knows? Uh, yeah. At this point in time, Claudio, you look at this object. You're not quite sure what it is, although it's very beautiful. Made of a very uh, finely lacquered wood. I also do a check as well, Matt. Yeah, sure. If, if you're interested in it, absolutely. Wow, sevens. It's all sevens tonight. <laughs> not any better. Three sevens and we go jackpot. Let's go. <laughs> so then, should I try and make that a triple? Uh, you're too far away, Mick. Mick, you're you're still back in the. I mean, in, on the edge. Shits and giggles. I get a twelve. Yeah, yeah I, I still, I've already seen sorta. it. I don't know what it is. I just wanted to see if I could get a seven. Yeah. Ah, oh, would have been nice. That would have yeah. been hilarious. Y you kind of think you know what this is associated with, Moinat? I mean, people throw their stuff in the sea all the time. But mm. not this. You've not seen. I mean, this. I have caused quite a few shipwrecks in my life, so. So, so would that be a history check? Yes, or would definitely. It be investigation. Uh, I, I will. I will leave it up to you. Which one would you prefer to use? 
Well, I'll move up closer to see what she's holding in her hand. Okay. And FYI, we have had another redemption. This one to give you mm -hmm. inspiration. And this one uh, goes to Amnestria. Amnestria, you now have inspiration on a d20 roll uh, at some time between now and next session. Uh, I'll try an investigation. All right, let's see it. Hey! Oh my goodness. Mick, Mick, you're not sure from where. You're not sure why. But this object is very familiar to you. You look at it, and just for a second, your head sort of rings with some kind of unknown pain, and you grab it just to sort of see if you can stifle it. And you... As you open your eyes, it's almost like a vision comes to it. And you see this object being held by multiple hands as if it was being used on top of another object, like a table. But that table or board on which this object is being placed has letters upon it. And the words yes, no, and goodbye written on it. For some reason or another, these hands are moving this object with the small lens around this board so that the lens seems to move almost on top of these letters, indicating spellings of words, perhaps. Why that would occur, you don't know. Um, so, Mick will cool say, I, I don't know why, but I, I think I know what this thing is for. It's for, I, I don't know, spirits? I don't know. It's spirit channeling or communicating with spirits. I don't know. But this is only one part of this. The part that you hold there's also a board that goes with it well, this so thing you seem to know behind. more than all of them sorry yes no 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 go ahead that's all I was going to say this thing left it behind so it must be important or dangerous or probably nothing at all but Mimia, you you seem to know more about this thing than Mick Mick than the rest of us do. So, can you channel with it and ask it where the tavern is? I just <laughs> roll I my eyes at him and tuck it inside. As I said, this is only one part of this system. It's like a bottle cap for a beer or something. It's essentially useless on its own. Should find the other piece then. Where Have that we figured would be, out I the directions know. east, west, north, south yet? Um, make a survival check, Claudio. I'm not really terrible at that, but. Yeah, not so good. Although we did may have... May I make one as well? You may, and we have had... It's it's all about redemptions tonight. We seem to have yep. another redemption. This one, uh, a minor one. Tempt Fates, common to Roka deck. Mm -hmm. So I'll bring out the common deck, and we'll do a pull from that. We would like to know, however, who this is going to. So, Redeemer in chat, please let us know to whom this particular pull of the deck common or otherwise, will go to, so that they can be tempted in some way. Wait for it. Waiting. <laughs> in the meantime, bit of I, I will, uh, I will certainly, yes, it's always about dramatic timing. Um, I will go ahead and pull the card. Maybe that'll make a little bit of a difference. Here's the card. Oh, it's going to Claudius. It's going to Claudio. Okay, here we go. Claudio. The card is the missionary. Claudio, this card, uh, I'm allowed to tell you exactly what it is that you will 
choose if you decide to do so. Um, if not, then the user will get their points, of course, back. Um, but tell me if you would like to have this particular boon placed upon you, and I'll give you the uh, the flavor to it, shall I say. Sure. Let's hear the boon. Okay. Uh, I mean, I that, that kind of would match more Mick Mick. Looking at that description. Uh, there we go. Uh, the missionary? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, the, the description that comes oh, up. Oh, yes. Those who spread wisdom and faith to others, warnings of the spread of fear and ignorance, is what the card means. Hmm. Uh, but what the boon is may be somewhat related. Here we go. Uh, the missionary. I always need to find it. Missionary. Come on. I got to put these things in alphabetical order next time. Got my hands on my keyboard, Matt. I'm ready, ready, ready. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> as you watch, um, and is, this is just for you, Claudio, a man appears before you. This man uh, is dressed in a long uh, purple and gold robe. A vision, clearly, as you can sort of, he is translucent and you can see through him. Um, and you see that his belt is laden with uh, m massive uh, uh, sacks of uh, some kind of material. You're not quite sure if it's gold or um, any other, other kind of currency. And um, he reaches out his hand, palm up towards you, and says, Tithes for the needy? Sure. What do you give to this individual? Let me see what I got. Yeah. Um, I give him a gold piece. He looks at the gold piece in his hand and says, That is all you give to those in need? And his looks become dour. One more, I only have one more gold piece. The muscles in his jaw tighten and says, Those in need certainly will take all that you can give. I give him my last gold piece. <laughs> okay. Your second gold piece clinks in his hand and his sort of tight-skinned fingers curl over it and he smiles showing yellow teeth and says you have done your heritage proud and then he turns and disappears into the mist for the next 24 hours Claudio you are under the effect of a bless spell hmm and this card now goes into the cursed deck. So basically you can add a d4 to attack, to an attack rolls and saving, and saving, and saving throws. throws. That's correct. Not bad. For the next 24 hours. Okay. So. That is one of our three redemptions for Tempt the Fates. Um, it is at that time, Amnestria, um, I'd like you to make a perception check, please. I also got a 20 on that survival check, by the way. Super, yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, I, I will keep that in mind. Thank you. No problem. Uh, let me just find perception. There it is. Okay. Nice. Amnestria, you spy something to the east. Um, Muy not, you know uh, now instinctively somehow or other, maybe through your sort of natural affinity to the world, although not this world, that this road on which you were walking went north and south, and this road moves northwest to southeast. Amnestria, to the southeast, you're pretty sure you see a light. Through the through the mist. Hmm. 
though I don't know what's down that way, but I do believe I see something through the fog. She would point in the direction. In which direction is she pointing in? She points it in the southeast direction. I don't know which way southeast is. I'll ping it on, on the map. map. Yeah, it's like that. If, if, if we're looking northwest, if we're looking, you know, north, north, south, west, east. Okay, so, so then it's definitely in this direction. I will give a pointed look at Claudio and say, perhaps it is a tavern. Perhaps. Um... Why don't you go look? It's a signpost. Is that there's a signpost actually there, or is that just on the map? It is. It is on the map, and it is there, but there are no signs on it. It is uh, just okay. the so post no, nothing itself. Written. Nothing uh, okay. written. Just the post. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. Which, Which is towards even more disconcerting. Towards that light. Okay. Claudius starts to walk towards the light. The light. Walk toward walk the, the light, light. light. Yeah, I knew it was coming. There we go. I was just going to say, never follow the light. <laughs> well, there's lights out, outside tavern, so Claudio has no I light. know. Absolutely. All right. And so, I, like, as he, as he walks, I watch him go and I say, well... I suppose I know how to lure him to his death. <laughs> uh, do the rest of you follow? Can, a safe can, we hear, yes. can, can we hear her say this? Oh, I said that out loud, like quietly, but I said it out loud. Fair, fair. Um, all right. Cloud you and Amnestria and Mick Mick and Moy Not. As you walk in the direction of the light, um, the light rain that was drizzling upon you becomes perhaps more pronounced. It becomes maybe a little heavier and into a more of a real rainstorm, per se. I'm going to take you away you from a, this a map. A small smile flicker across Moynat's face. Now, you saw that roll? I did. Very nice. <laughs> Not a cop, still stealthy. Still pretty stealthy. You it's can always... take the Alex out of the cop, but you can't take the cop out of the Alex. <laughs> Quietly, he moves through the darkness and the rain and fog. And he's not a rogue either. So. And he's not a rogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so as the four of you walk through the rain, uh, you are able to find the source of this light. And uh, it is not just light that first you uh, sense either. It is sound as well. Um, you are able to, uh, in the rain, hear music. You're able to hear violin music. And although the rain is still coming down and the mists still surround you, there is something somewhat comforting in the fact that you are no longer alone, even though the music coming forward towards you is somewhat mysterious and certainly forlorn. It is, for, yeah, go ahead, please. Say for a moment, I feel compelled to sing, hmm. but then I stop myself and instead I pull the lyre from my back and begin to play along. Okay, uh, make a performance check for me. Let's see how well you can play. Pretty well. Ooh, nice. Yeah, That's you find- yeah, you found you found the right key. You find the right um, timbre. You find you find the right pitch. You find the right time, 
and you're able I mean, to play along. Singing. Yeah, and thank goodness she's not singing. Um, but the, as you as you play, it's almost as if signaled by your playing, the rain really starts to come down now, and you hear the peals of thunder in the background. As you approach, the individuals casting this music and light into this area of this fog-enshrouded wasteland. And you see, sitting on the steps of a colorfully painted wagon, um, a, 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 a duo of people. You see a man who is carrying this violin and a young girl who has, uh, who has in her hands um, a, um, a... It's very hard to understand what it is really at first, but as you get closer, you realize that it's actually some kind of a... Um, of a book? Although it doesn't look like a book at first. Um, it looks like a, like a box, to be honest. But she has it open, and she is taking pages out of it, looking at it in the rain, and then putting it back inside the box. She's taking more pages out of it, handing it to the young man. He nods as he sings and plays the music, and places it back inside the box. And as the four of you approach, um... Let me see here. Uh, you hear them call out to you, the, the young woman at first, the young girl. She waves at you and she says, Vujat! Vujat! She says it in a language unknown, perhaps uh, Are you to sure? all. I speak a lot. You do. Uh, it, this is. Uh, for all but uh, Claudius' character, a completely unknown language to you. Even to you, Amnestria. You may have heard it once or twice, but for certain, to you, Claudius, you recognize the language, although you can't speak it very well. This is the language of the people known as the Vistani, a traveling group of nomadic peoples who Back, Legend? you're out of focus. Oh, let's try that again. How's that better? Nope. I try again. Ooh, spookiness. Is it working? <laughs> Darn camera. You're, you're still out of focus. Still Pull out of focus. Your face. Pull your hand towards your face this time. I just do this? No, pull it like back towards your Pull it you back like towards my face? Here we go. Let's try it again. Yeah. Is that working? No. No. Don't it camera. Matter, man. I can still see your face. <laughs> It'll probably we resolve. We can see you. You're minutes. just blurry. Uh, okay. Maybe it's my lighting. That's fine. I detected the Vistani from the music. You did. You recognize these. At any these rate, people. I'm still stuck, and I don't think anybody else can see me. So I will remain that way and observe the situation. I will approach. All right. Still playing. Oh, you're right. It's so strange. Yeah, you're like, it just doesn't It's want so to weird, play. right? <laughs> Let me, uh... I'm gonna do my video settings. Maybe that helps. As you fiddle with your video, I will approach them and say, your music is beautiful. I do not believe I have ever heard its kind before. Yeah, uh, the girl and the, and the young man, um, almost to sort of unknowing what language you speak as well. Um, let's do this and see if that works. Oh. Oh, that works. Maybe if I do that. Ah, oh, look! 
Hey! There you go. What's this? Hello. Yay, camera. Mm -hmm. um, sort of look at you uh, and says, uh, Giorgio. Giorgio. And she points to you. Says, Giorgio, Bujat. I will try again in Elvish. Okay. And then Sylvan. Okay. Then Primordial. And finally in Abyssal. Okay. Uh, as you sort of cycle through these languages, um, the rest of you who maybe know some of these languages note that Muinat seems to be quite well versed in languages. That's for certain. Um, but it is only Claudio who recognizes this language, this Vistani language. Claudio, you recognize what this little girl is saying. She's saying the words Vujat means come, come in. She's beckoning you towards the safety, perhaps, and warmth of this wagon. Is she also doing the hand motion? She is, but she's she's not just like doing this, like, come on, come on, come on. She's just like putting her hand out. I circle around the wagon and stay hidden. Considering okay. I do a lot of beckoning myself in my life, can I make an insight check to see if she means us any harm? Absolutely. Hard to track with little girls sometimes, you know? Oh, fuck, only a nine, okay. Yeah. Um, but you are... Even in your perhaps less than stellar insight, able to determine um, that, at least from your perspective, and the fact that she hasn't launched you in, into an attack against any of you, that they don't seem overtly hostile. She points over at Amnestria, and she says, Bruyala, Vorjat, Vorjat. Claudio, although you're hidden in the shadows, you understand what she says. She says, Ghost, come here, come in. All right, I'll come out of the shadows. And I'll and I'll look at them and she's and and say she's calling you ghosts and telling you to come in. Rhea would move closer and sort of get into view and she would simply oh, Ow. Sorry. Uh she would simply lower her cloak and and ask this individual exactly how they would note this. Okay. Of course, I don't think they can understand me, so... I will relay what you say in this time to them. Cool. Uh, yeah, they... Are you still hidden, though? Uh, no, he, he came out. He okay. came out of the shadows. Um, which was at least a little a little jarring, seeing that he was there one moment, he was started walking to the light, he disappeared, and now there he is on the other side of the wagon coming out and saying, no, 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 no calling you ghost. You're a little bit taken aback for a second. But certainly no ill intent. Uh, another word of mention, we've had our second of three Tempt the Fates tonight. Um, so oh, that one goes to Amnestria. Amnestria, let's go ahead and have you uh, draw a common card. And I will shuffle, of course, as I always do. And we will deal a card. Watch this is a freaking missionary. That yeah. would be hilarious, right? No, this is unfortunately not the miss missionary. This is the healer. Ooh. Interesting. Hmm. The healer means rest, healing, obviously, and recovery. Those who practice the healing arts. 
And what does that mean? I will tell you. The healer. Okay. Hmm, how to put this one into the current situation? Let's see. Okay. Um. Yeah, it looks like you may have to draw an additional card because this one unfortunately doesn't do anything at this point in time. So we're looks gonna like put there's that already one flipped back. over on the top of the deck. Let's grab that one. Sure, let's do that. That is the Necromancer. Ooh. How interesting. Just the opposite. Odd. Okay. The, the art on these cards is gorgeous. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, really okay. Mm. So here we go. This is an interesting uh, note for you, how to, how to put this one into perspective. Here we go. Um, you have a vision, Amnestria, of yourself. Lying on the ground, a pool of blood puddling out of your back, and shadowy figures over you, reaching towards you to end your life. And your eyes are closed, and you are not breathing. And then one of these shadowy hands touches you in the center of your chest, and you feel a power shoot through you and your eyes flutter open. From a technical perspective, the next 24 hours, the next time you will be brought to zero hit points, you are instead brought to one hit point. Do you Death choose Lord. this card? <laughs> Let's do it. Done. This card will also go into the cursed deck. The Necromancer and the Missionary are now cursed. Your vision fades immediately, Amnestria. It only took a second or two. Claudio, as you translate to the rest of the group and to the Vistani who you have met, uh, the young man knocks on the door to the wagon. You know them as Vardos. These wagons are called. These beautifully painted, ancient wood wagons. And from within, the door opens. I take a step backward as this happens. And the man gestures to within. And he, for the first time, says, in very heavily broken common, he waits. Go. Uh, so, if, if I could bother you for a second, you see, I've given away my money to an apparition. No money. She waits. Go. I'll talk to her. I go inside the the, the, the Vardo. Ah, uh, yes, another redemption. This I'll put into my pocket for later. This is something spooky this way comes. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Um, Claudio, do you enter the wagon? Mm hmm Cool. Muinat, Amnestria, and Mikmik, -Mik, what do you do? I enter the wagon as well. Okay. Yeah, Mikmik's going to enter, and even though he is pretty much completely soaked through at the moment, his hair is still standing end on end. Love I am it. going to cautiously walk to the door and sort of poke my head inside. Okay. The first person who does walk in immediately notes that this place is warm and dry, and you sent um, inside... You sent that um, there is some kind of a strange perfume in the air. Um, maybe a uh, uh, some kind of a, a, a burning incense that keeps the scent of this particular space 
um, pungent and aromatic. Um, you also spy that there is someone inside this wagon. Um, from your perspective, the only thing that you can see in the dark space within, lit by a scant few lamps, um, is a small, hunched-over figure shuffling an enormous deck of three uh, to, I would say larger, actually, probably more five to six inch long uh, paper cards. And her head, as you can see, it is a female because she has long gray tassels of hair and uh, a sort of grizzled but bright-eyed face of a, an older woman. You see that around her neck are baubles and glittering coins that are arrayed in a necklace around her beautifully painted um, uh, and, and beautifully uh, decorated, I should say, uh, chemise. And she looks up at the four of you, and I would, I, I would go ahead and assume, Mick, Mick, you're the last one in the door. Actually, I am, because I haven't you really are? come in yet. I've just Perfect. poked my head in. Even better. I would actually think Mick Mick would be probably second in. He would be getting out of the rain as quickly as possible. Sure. Absolutely. Claudio and Nestria, Mick Mick. Mui not, you're the last one in. She, as she's shuffling these cards, you know, with expertise, she's not even looking at them. She's just immediately doing all kinds of amazing uh, sort of uh, feats of Flourishes? dexterity and flourishes. Nothing like a magician would do. Right? Nothing so preposterously um, uh, showy. But just Stubbiness. speed. Exactly. And she says to you, as she points to you with a, a long crooked finger, Moinat, she says, close the door. I'll catch a draft. I will reluctantly come the whole way in and close the door behind me. Still hear the rain from outside. But you are no longer in this space. You are now... inside this wagon. You look down at the table in front of you. And you see... A beautiful, amidst all these candles and coins, a beautiful, well, it's a, a mat of, of some sort. It's decorated with all these different um, geometric patterns and strange shapes, beautifully crafted and held down by crystals and coins and candles. And she says to the four of you, sit, sit. I have been expecting you. Whether you have expected me or not is a different story. I say to her in Vistani, do you think I could have a quick drink? She smiles, showing a couple of missing teeth and says, not of the liquid that you desire, my friend. And she gives you a wry smile. It's rather ominous. I'm only asking for alcohol. Not that it would have any effect that you would desire. But if you desire wine, I may, of course, grant it. And she puts the cards on the table, reaches back around to a sort of gourd of wine, places a small glass on the table and pours a glass for you. Oh, thank Ezra. Finally. And Claudio sits down as he begins to sip the wine. She says, I hope you enjoy it. Please. Maria would, 
simply sit next to him. I never really do, but to have it. Very true. The others of you may, of course, sit, take a load off, as they say. I will sit. Keeps the hunger at bay, so to speak. I'm keeping myself as far from the lamps as I can. Mick Mick? Um, well, are the, uh, the chairs human-sized or gnome-sized? They're human-sized. Oh, I assumed you were sitting on the floor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, so, it is a caravan, so would there be seats is the question, or is it just seat on the floor? You could sit on the floor, or you could sit in one of the four chairs that are in front of this table. I think uh, Mick Mick would take a seat as best he can and maybe try and climb up on it a little bit. Some small one, and I will help him clamber onto the chair. And I'm sorry for being so rude. Uh, my name is Claudio Unesco from Barovia. What is your name, I ask him this time. She says, I know of you, Claudio Unesco. Maybe you know of my people as you are people and my people have known each other for many years. Your master, whether you know him as that or not, and I are on interesting terms with one another. He says, my name is Madame Eva. Pleasure to meet you, Eva. You, when you say the master, do you speak of the Count of Borough? We do not speak him. We speak him in words. The devil. But he is no longer your worry. You are in a different place. Your fate and the fate of all of you have been changed. What they are, only the cards know. And I am, of course, to let you know through them. Interesting. She well, shuffles the cards some more. She says, shall I deal? Indeed. Excellent. Before I deal, I must know one and only one question to be answered by the cards. And she puts her hands in the center of the table. Discuss if you will, but I will require an answer in the next minute if the power of the cards is to be given. My hand floats briefly up to the horns around my head and then to the necklace and then down. And I say, I look at the others and I say, I want to know who did this to me. And Mick Mickles, just here hearing um, Moynat say that, he'll kind of not as openly say, but maybe on his breath, that makes two of us. Well, I don't need to know who did this to me. I did this to myself. In a fit of depression, I walked into the damn fog. And I know full well who did this to me, but not where they are, so finding them could be useful. Your questions seem to be funneled into a point. And it seems that although some of you may wish to know what or who has given you the fate that you now are receiving, others may wish to know more about what fate may have in store for them. So be it. We will let the cards show. And she takes the cards and she places five of them on the table. I'll let you know this, folks. I've only done two tarot card readings in my entire life, so let's see how this goes. <laughs> a 
Okay. All right, the first card actually goes like this. So this is actually not from the common deck or the high deck. This is from the full deck. So I'm actually going to take the full deck out. And I'm going to deal one card. They drew it. And she says, the core of the issue is what this card represents. And then she takes out another card. She pulls it out. She turns it sideways. She places it on top. Like this. And she says, This is the cross. This represents a complication. Obstacle. Clarification. Of the heart. That is the swashbuckler. The representation of the swashbuckler here. Those who like money yet give it up freely. She then takes out four more cards. Not five, I'm sorry. Six cards, not five. And she places them swiftly around the table. By the way, I'm doing this without stacking the deck, folks. This is the way it's coming out. Shuffled and all. This is my preferred tarot read format. I like it. The Paladin. The Hooded One. The Illusionist. And finally... The wizard. I will explain each of what they mean. And you can draw your own conclusions from this. Uh, I don't get a hover on the druid. Yep, I'll, I'll put that in in a second. I think I just left that one out. Okay, uh, card three. That is the hooded one. The hooded one, she says, this is the blood. This is what will be taken from the subject. Card four, which is the wizard. This is the flesh. This is what the subject must willingly give up in order to succeed or progress. Card five is the paladin. This is the face in the mist, the outcome or conclusion. Often what will be gained if the proper sacrifices are made, but it may also simply be a summing up of what is to come. And finally, the illusionist represents the bone. This is what will remain after the conclusion. So it is a progression, as you see. From Druid, Swashbuckler, Hooded One, Paladin, Wizard, Illusionist. I will what tell you does what the each. Swashbuckler and the Druid mean. I will tell you. Here we are. Let's see. I have meanings for all these cards, folks. The swashbuckler, yes. Those who like money yet give it up freely. Likeable rogues and rapscallions. But it also means those controlled by greed or envy. False friends. The wizard, mystery and riddles, the unknown, those who crave magical power and great knowledge. But it also means power too great to wield reaching for the unattainable, things that are unknowable. Beware this. And the druid, she says, means balance of nature, 
and those who revere nature, release of emotions, but also inner turmoil or insanity. And finally, the illusionist, lies and deceit, grand conspiracies, secret societies, the presence of a saboteur, perhaps, in your midst, but also seeing things for what they are, realizing someone or some what something or someone is not what they show, but they are false. The cards have been drawn. The meanings for you may be derived as you will. But these are your fates. I wish you well. And she sits How back. How do I get... Okay. She just sits back in her chair. Go ahead, Claudia. <laughs> How do I get back to Barovia? When the cards, she says, have run their course, you will find your ways. Perhaps home? Perhaps to a place that you would call home. I am going to pull the thing I found on the ground from my pocket and place it in the center of the cards directly over the druid and the swashbuckler and say, what can you tell me of this? She smiles and she says, this is a planchette, a divining rod, for the spirits, it must, of course, be used with a spirit board. Do you have said board? I do not know. Well, then, this is of no use to you without that. I found it in place of a creature I may or may not have recognized. I believe it to be part of why we are here. You are very smart. And she smiles. And you tell us where here is? She looks around. She says, you are in my wagon, of course. <laughs> Of course, you wish to know where here is. You are one who constantly searches for where you are and what you should do. Is that not correct, Duchess? It is correct. Perhaps you should be less concerned about who you are and more concerned about who you are not. Hmm. And she just sort of stares at you. And you! And she says this at like really like loud volume, right at Mick Mick. She says, of course, my little friend. How do you fare? In what way are you talking about? I mean, I just feel like I've just woken up from a real bad hangover. Something I think one of these new party members would know a hell of a lot about. Well, you look worse for a wear, as they say. Exactly, but uh, may I ask, would you happen to have a spirit board? I do not. My people... We do not trade with spirits if we can help it. We only deal in fate. 
Do you know anyone or where we could go to find a spirit board to use this planchette with? The corners of her mouth sort of lift a little bit, and she says, I know not of what fate will deliver to you. But, uh, as my people say, when one shoe drops, the other is sure to follow. Tell me then, which what do you know? I know very little. The cards know everything. I am simply their... Their... Purveyor. Do your cards then know who has done this to me? Clearly. And she points at the table at this sort of strange arrangement. And she says, but they are mysterious, the cards. They speak in riddles as my people sometimes do, because to tell the truth would not be wise. Well then, I suppose I'll have to figure this out on my own. And I will take the planchette back in my pocket and leave the wagon. Okay. You open the door to the wagon, and a rush of cold air comes in, and all of the lights from this wind are immediately doused. And even those of you with dark vision, for some strange reason, cannot see anything except for what is outside. You look back towards the table. Madame Ava was there a second ago, as were the cards. But now, there is nothing. She is gone. You look outside to see where the other two Vistani were, the ones with the beautiful and haunting music. They are as well gone. So are we still in the uh, the caravan, or is that just... You're still in the wagon. No, you're still in the wagon. I'm out. I have left the caravan. Mu Muinat has left. I will follow after her. Well, I think we're done here. I'll step out. This is why I put okay. no trust in witches. So. She's not a witch. So, oh, then what would you call her? I would call her medium. Hmm. I do not know this word. Um, Amnestria, coming from uh, a place like Mordant, you certainly do. But perhaps it takes on a different tone, a different way. You, you've not seen people like this before, for certain. The Vistani do not come to Mordant. Or if they do, you have never met one. But the word medium, the word that Claudio has just said, that is a profession in Mordant. That is someone who speaks to the very real presences of spirits within that place and helps others to reach out to those, those ghostly beings. And, Claude, just what do you know of mediums? Well, they're all over Barovia. 
They claim that they they can divine your fate through cards, but really, really they 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 cajole with spirits. Found it odd that she didn't have a spirit board. Uh, well, she's not there now, so I. Are we standing in the rain? You are. I mean, unless you're standing in just inside the, the dark, wagon. Well, I'm gonna keep standing in the dark wagon until the rain goes away. Really, it's fair. I'll keep sipping. I'll keep sipping the water. I'm gonna start ru- like if there's no people around, I'm rummaging around the outside of the caravan looking for anything useful. Okay, make an investigation check, whilst this conversation is occurring. Okay, sixteen. Um. Uh, you look around the wagon. There are no horses attached to it or hitched to it, which is very strange. Um, the wagon is beautifully painted, very brightly painted. Uh, you see that it's it's somewhat old by the the, the um, uh, state of the wood, um, and that the paint uh, on it has been perhaps put on it multiple times. You see that it's very thick, but it's still very bright, very um, uh, vibrant. Um, You do not see, looking under it, around it, over it, any trace of anything, either outside or inside this wagon besides what you've already encountered. It's an enormous waste of time. Claudio, if I think that was your name, right? Yeah. What are the chances that this, what we were just experiencing, were spirits? Very high. I I have no idea. Seeing as it looks like there's nothing here, this seems abandoned yet. I distinctly remember that we're in a nice, warm caravan. Now it's nothing. All I know, my friend, is that the wine in my chalice is real. Oh, And that an apparition took two of my gold coins. The wind begins to build a little bit at this point. Like you land dwellers put such faith in gold. Strange. Hmm. I suppose we should set up camp or continue walking in a direction. Either way, I need to eat something. The road does go past this wagon in a southeastern direction. It seems to me that you land dwellers generally find taverns on roads. Perhaps we continue along this one. But if you don't mind, I really should disappear for a bit. I'll meet up with you guys. And you just disappeared just before we got ran into this caravan. So I will do something similar. I will take care of something, and then when I have taken care of that something, I will meet with you. Strange man. Well, off I go. I'm just going to start walking down the road. Okay. Claudio, you separate from the other three, and, uh... Tell me what it is that you do. I'm going to whisper to you. Go for it. Tell me whether or not you want me to uh, mention it out loud. No. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I, I think I know what you're doing. I'm pretty sure. But we can keep that separate from the other three. Oh, the only people who will know is chat. Of course. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 100%. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Moinat and Mestria and Mikmik, the, uh, gentleman Claudio, um, sort of wanders through the brush into the 
nearby forest, sort of looking along the ground, and then he disappears from view. Well, he's certainly a strange one. Well, while they're um, walking, Mick Mick will try and adjust his, um, the bandage on his arm because it's currently falling down, so he just and just to back up, tries to twist it so it's a little bit more tighter because all this rain is soaking it through. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be stopping either. That's the strange thing. No. Nah. Moy now just visibly completely unbothered by the water, by the rain. Love it. <gasps> what about you, Nestrian? What are you doing? Uh, I am examining my two companions a little closer because I haven't really done that. Yeah. Um, what are you examining them for? Just sort of looking them up and down, giving them a Real thorough look? Well, they seem a little odd, and that's saying something. <laughs> so i trying to figure out their origins, where they might be from, perhaps. Okay. You could make an investigation check. I'll give it one for, one for both. Investigation for inside, maybe. Uh, insight is more uh, body language and voice. I would say if you're really trying to sort of look at them from an outside perspective, then investigation is the appropriate one. Oof. Uh, difficult to tell. It's a five. So yeah, Nestria, something... Oh, is that one for each? It's one for both. So five and nine... It's a five for both. I told before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Moy not you don't you don't recognize her. Where you, you don't even really understand maybe what she is. She's got these beautiful sort of bluish horns coming out of her head, but she's not a tiefling. That's for certain. Uh, Mick Mick is about the size of a of a gnome. You've seen gnomes, very few of them in Mordent, but there are some. Um, but he doesn't look like any gnome you've ever seen. That's for sure. Well, it's, I think it's probably pretty easy to see that the arm that isn't bandaged probably does have a few scars on it. With a five, yes, you get you get the fact that it's scarred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why not is essentially flawless, but a little bit scary. With a so higher investigation, she'd be a lot scary. <laughs> <laughs> She's just a little scary with a five. But like, with, if you got like a, a 16, you'd be like, oh shit. Um, so yeah. Amnestria, Mick, Mick, and, and Moynat, you walk, I would assume, down the road through the rain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Claudio, you do what you're doing. I would say... Uh, you could either whisper me a roll or roll it in the open and I won't tell anybody what it means, but you could roll a survival or investigation check, Claudio. Mm -hmm. okay. to and I'll let you know <laughs> what comes of that. We shall see. Your choice. Survival? Okay. Wow. Investigation. Yeah. My investigation again. Super high. Yeah, I would say you definitely... The answer to your question is yes. How's that? And uh, whatever comes of that uh, is certainly pleasing to you. I'm certain. Perfect. So then I make my way back to the party. Okay. Um, you watch as Claudio sort of comes out of the woods. He comes traipsing through the woods. Um, he, uh, he doesn't look so sort of stiff anymore. Um, he looks, he looks, uh, his face maybe is a little bit more, um, more, le or maybe less pale, shall we say. But not enormously, he's still very, very, you know, very drawn. His features are very defined. 
Uh, but he seems to be perhaps in a, a better mood. Maybe it was the wine. So I walk over, um, chalice still in hand. And I'm like, well, yes, about that tavern. Have we figured out what direction we're walking in? Southeast. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That's the direction. Best direction ever. Let's just go southeast. I mean, considering none of us knows where we are, I'm assuming. I can't even Ooh. tell direction. I look at the chalice and I get my say, I'm not surprised. What would be in front? Let me think. I think more not. You set I've, off first. Right? Yeah, yeah, I've kind of just been. Pa I've like I have. I'm on a goddamn mission. I'm just power walking down this road. Yeah. So I think Moynat is probably in the front. Then probably Mick Mick's probably bring up the rear. It's doing it again, Dan. Camera. Let's try it again. Let's see if the camera likes me now. I'm right here. Come on back. Come on, camera. There we go. Camera is it? Is it the Logitech Brio? It is. Which is like it never went awry. Until it's the tonight. lighting. You gotta, you it gotta is. put a light in your in your background. I do. Maybe I should keep the light on in the kitchen. I'm scared to get up, guys. I'm gonna be perfectly fucking honest. I don't want to get up because I like my my apartment is very quiet, very dark right now. And if I get up, I feel like something's gonna jump out. I've been watching a lot of horror movies, <laughs> so I think I can. I think actually I could figure a good place to to do this. Here we go. Um, four of you. Rejoin the road and walk southeast. And it is almost all at once, all of you, that you turn over a rise of this rather dark and soggy landscape, and you see a house. This house has no lights in it, it is dark. But you are able to see from your position that there do seem to be several figures on the front lawn. Some of them are holding lanterns. Around this house is a rather craggy and somewhat short iron fence that seems to fence in the entire property. But the house itself is rather large. It it's almost like a manor house, and it has three stories to it. First, second, third floor. Quite a lot of windows around it. You also see a balcony atop the second floor. People who could point us in the direction of a tavern. Excellent. Or maybe they have alcohol for you. That would be wonderful as well. Roll my eyes and keep walking. As you approach this house, you notice that the house itself um, actually has two distinctly different architectural styles to it. That the house itself has um, the manor portion, again, a three, two to three story house, which actually seems quite old and um, very rickety looking. Quite, not quite sure how it's staying standing, considering its current position, current condition, I should say. And the second of these two architectural uh, styles, which is a turret of a, a stone make, perhaps of a, a long crumbled fortress, that this house is directly next to, perhaps even attached to. And, um, yeah, attached to this house, which is weather-beaten and veined with ivy, as you walk towards the house, you see three, these three figures, um, all walking with lanterns towards the front door. And one of the lights in the house goes on through the window, which is somewhat, at least you believe it's shuttered. 
and the three figures stop as this window emits a flickering light from within. Just approach the figures. Okay. I'm going to hang back for the time being and watch this unfold. I'm going to stay uh, back Mick out Mick of is... eyesight of the three figures. Mick Mick is uh, probably at the start, but he's actually not looking at the three figures. He's just looking at the house and something is coming back in his mind. So he's just sitting there kind of glass-eyed at the moment, just staring at the house as some memories come back. Make a, a history check with disadvantage at this point, Mick Mick. Let's see what you remember. History? Because yeah. of my background. Correct. Yeah. History... Oh, sorry. Uh, that's an eight. Something... There, there's two sides of this feeling that comes through your mind, Mick Mick. One side is... Something's in there. Something's gonna remind me of what it is that... that happened. And the other side of it is... Don't go in that house. Yep, so that, that's basically just Mick Mick's just going to be standing still, just looking at the house, seeing if that memory can clear up a little bit. So, yeah. Not noticing what the, the three people actually walking towards the house. Okay. Cloud is just... walking towards them. Mick Mick is sort of staying behind. I'm Nestri and Moynat. What about you? I rolled stealth. I am staying back out of eyesight for the time being. I'm just watching cool. this unfold. I want to see what's happening. All right. Uh, Nestri, I would just simply call it to the figures and say, excuse us. Okay. Bold. I like it. I'm Nestri, you walk perhaps with Claudio towards these three figures standing on this sodden hill and uh, they come closer into view um, one figure is a, a tall dark skinned man wearing a, a leather raincoat um, and he has a, a rather large leather satchel by his side um, he seems outfitted to bear in the same way that you are actually um, he has a couple of strange accoutrements on his belt, on his back. Uh, he carries a, um, a scabbard with a sword placed inside of it. Uh, and uh, he sort of looks at you coming up the hill. He has a wide-brimmed hat, uh, also leather, um, and a, a sort of look in his eyes of, of weariness, but also, um, well, certainly... Uh, of interest as you uh, climb up the hill towards them. The second of these three figures is a small, uh, not gnome-sized, maybe more uh, halfling-sized uh, uh, figure. Uh, not necessarily in indeterminate gender, but um, facial features are, are difficult to uh, sort of narrow down. Uh, bright blue eyes, long hair kelped up in a ponytail, uh, wearing uh, a rather sort of neat and trimmed uh, suit, also with a leather poncho on. The third of these figures is actually not standing at all. Um, he's sitting down. Uh, he is in a strange contraption with wheels on its side. It's made of wood, leather, and metal. Um as if it were a chair that was meant to move around uh, via traversing through these wheels on its side. and um, um, He is not wearing um, a, a leather jacket, um, but he has a very sort of strange device that he's holding above his head, which is a, a long wooden shaft with a leather top to it. Um, it's almost like a parasol, but it has a leather top to it. And it seems to be coated with some kind of a waterproof material as the rain, as it falls upon it, is, is drizzling off of it. Um, 
underneath this device, you see that he wears no hat. Um, he has very pale skin. Uh, he wears a, a, a pair of uh, strangely shaded glasses under which you cannot see his eyes. Um, light, uh, almost blonde, uh, light brown hair. And uh, pointed ears, indicating he is an elf. And so, as yeah, you approach, go ahead. Yeah, so hello. Um, uh, just inquiring in the direction of a tavern or a town somewhere to get out of the rain. The uh, dark skinned individual speaks first and says, <laughs> You hear that, Hellenic? A town? Where did you come from? Barovia. They're all three of them. Their eyes sort of grow wide. And then they look at each other for a second and say, uh, again, the dark skinned man says, Barovia, you say? How noble. Indeed. I assume you do not have the markings of a Bistani. I assume that the mists took you as well. And he motions to the that other. The others of you that he can see. Well, I think they're under a different predicament. Mine was a fit of depression, um, and I sort of stumbled into the mist. No, I didn't stumble. I decided to walk into it. Yes. You walked into it? Yes, it's a rather long story, really, and uh, rather drab and... <laughs> And yeah, we've heard many of those, have we not, Alanic? Alanic, the person who he is speaking to, is the man in the chair. And he has been doing nothing but studying you. His hands are sort of steepled in front of his face as he looks you up and down, Claudio. And uh, he puts up a hand towards his friend and says, Arthur, quite enough. I think we've had quite enough. I know very little about you, but I wish to know more, as you seem quite well equipped. And this man with the shaded glasses looks at you, Amnestria, and says, uh, You are uh, a hunter, are you not? Of a sort, yes. Of a sort. Yes, of course. We are, as well, hunters. Hunters of information. And of truth. What kind of truth? Ah, the truth that is bared wit borne witness by those who decide to fight against those powers of darkness that this land seems to exhibit. He's just spouting out enormously long words and sentences. Sounds really, really smart, or perhaps thinks he's really smart. I suppose we could have a discussion over some wine or ale or something distilled. Yeah? Um, yes, I can see that perhaps being... And he looks at you in the cards. Um, if necessary, we could lead you to perhaps further within Borka after our work is completed. Where? What's the name of this town? Oh, this land is called Borka. 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 B O R C A. Borka. Oh, Borka. Got you. You have yes. no Wonderful. idea what that is. Amnestria, you can I make a. Either. Yeah, history, <laughs> if you want. That's up to you. Sure. Let me, sure. Let me do the history check. I'm not even going to try. 
He says, if you would like, we could um, discuss inside out of the rain. We have quite a lot of work to do, and perhaps, perhaps you could aid us. Of course. Glad to hear. My name is Claudio Unesco, and you are? I am Alanic Ray, the great detective. I'm the great detective. Yes, of course you've heard of me. No. Yes, of course. Of course I have. He looks at you, Amnestria, he looks sort of, gives a, a little bit of a grimace, and then he looks over at you, Chloe, oh yes, good, excellent. Are they, see? They can be of use to us. Cabe, please. Um, and he motions to the halfling with the large device and gives um, gives this halfling this parasol with a leather top and says, please, please, uh, do come inside out of the rain. We have things to do. Can I detect ill will? Make an insight check. Sure. They'll say, I want to do that from the shadows. Be my guest. No more plus 13s and plus 15s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seven, uh, 18. Uh, Claudio, you don't notice anything strange in the way he's speaking, other than that he just thinks he's just the bee's knees. Um, Moynot, from your position, you don't detect ill will, but you do detect um, that this, this guy, uh, Alanic, Ray, the great detective, feels that maybe you would be excellent as assistant in his plan of some kind. Whether that plan be ill or good, that's more difficult to discern. Fair, I'm staying hidden for now. Understandable. Amnestria, I cloud you. Inside. You go inside. Mick, Mick, what do you do? Um, well, after getting nothing from staring at the house all this time, he's going to notice that the rest of the, the or two of the three of the rest of these people he's been following have entered the building, so he's going to jog over there and try and enter the house with them. I'm right. going to... Is there somewhere for me to observe from a window outside without going in the house? All of the shutters are on the first floor. There are all, all the windows are shuttered on the first floor. Hmm. You could I... climb up to the balcony if you wanted to, but who knows what's up there? Mm, I would like to try to sneak into the house undetected. Okay. Go ahead and uh, make a stealth check. Quickly before I do that, however. Yeah. I'm going to cast Disguise Self. Okay. I wonder what you're using Disguise Self to disguise yourself as. Human. Okay. So I will look not terribly different than I do now, but uh, the horns will be gone. Uh, my eyes will be just normal, brown, human eyes. Uh, and I can't remember, can I change what my clothes, I can't, I don't think I can change my clothes with this. I don't believe so. Or maybe, maybe uh, you can. Honestly. Oh, yes, they, like, objects would pass through it, so I can put shoes on my feet, that's all I really Fair. want to do. Fair, okay, cool. I'll take so that. I'm gonna put some shoes on. Put some right. shoes on, and my hair might be a little bit shorter and perhaps a shade lighter. Excellent. Very minimal changes, but I now look decidedly human. Awesome. Right. And now I'll make a stealth roll to sneak into the house. Nat 20, baby! Damn! Look at that. Yeah, you definitely sneak. At some point, perhaps, uh, unbeknownst to everyone else, um, for certain, into this house. Um, as the four of you enter the house... That was a nat 20 and a nat 1. Nice. Exactly. <laughs> uh, as you enter the house, oh dear. Eel of Lightning goes off nearby. And Mick Mick, this sound and this flash 
your head starts to ring and you feel your heart begin to beat. And you drop to the ground just on the front porch. And that's where we're going to take a break. Yeah. So am I just prone? For right now, yes, or you are. Up. No, no, you're just prone. But we'll get back to you. After this break, we'll take a good uh, five minutes. We started a little late, but I think it's important to take a break because I have to do some things. Cool. Yes, all right. Okay. And get snacks and do all that kind of stuff. So, yes, we'll be back get in food. five minutes. Don't get go anywhere, food. folks. Drink. More stuff to do. Talk soon. All right, we're back. Hey. One person has left the group, but that's okay. We will come back to him at another time, perhaps next session. Claudio, uh, uh, I, you know, on a, on a ever-present search for alcohol, decides to join the rest of you in searching through the house, but we know his real motives. Uh, just looking for a drink. It's fine. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so I, I appear from my hidden position beneath the stairs, holding the planchette between my fingers and I say mm -hmm. make it 30 and I'll let you use this make a persuasion roll I'm down for that let's go that was a 21 bardy bard bard <laughs> uh, he looks over at Arthur and he goes do we have 30 per day Arthur goes um um I don't know, Ray. I, 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 I think we we might have thirty, but only for. Well, we I could just... do thirty for you. Can I? That's make and I just I look at him like that's fine. Wait a minute, you. You have twenty per day. But for you can't three do days 30. for four people. Well, if we did thirty per day for all of us, we for all of you, that that just wouldn't that wouldn't fetch. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we really I'm do. I'm fine if you only pay me. Of course, of course. You consider uh, it rent. Uh, the planchette. We do quite need that for the for the seance. Oh, I know. Yeah. That's why my cost is higher. I thought that you were amongst them all, but, um... Ah! I'm sorry, I just appeared from beneath your staircase. How do you know that I'm not a ghost? Uh... That's a good point. Uh, Cabe? Cabe? Uh, she, uh... Cabe looks at you and goes, Not a ghost. Something I else. I Cabe and I wink. I wink at Cabe. Cabe just blank faced at you. It's fine. So 30 for me then. 20 for my compatriots. Man, chat's still not coming through. Let me just fix that. Um. Uh, oh, I could just dear. put this away. No, 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 no. No, that's not. No. Um, uh, 30 for you, 20, 20 for them. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. I will hand the planchette to Cabe. Okay. Has anyone seen the small one? Oh, I believe he's passed out on the porch. He's passed out? Nice, oh, right over there. Can you just move somewhere a little? Oh, not going to let me do it. Are you? I can't actually he's see him. Right on the okay. <laughs> yeah, he's right, he's right by the door. <laughs> That's why I couldn't I'm on the other him. side of the wall. So if there's a window in there. In that one, the, yeah. door's, the door's open, right? I can just step yeah. outside. Yeah, the door's open. Just going to poke him. Make sure he's still alive. <laughs> well, technically, he's not passed out. He's just... um. Have it, oh, has I his know. back I'm up just, against I'm the wall. Just, I'm just yeah. being. He, he's just, um, 
uh, has his back up against the wall and is in the process of a, probably a little mild freak out. <laughs> Are you okay? Let me restart the page. That might help. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's that lightning. It just, I don't know. It just, it felt like it went through me for some reason. Awakened something in me. I don't know. It's, it's weird. That is rather odd. <laughs> but again, I suppose every person I've met today is a little odd. Do you need help I, getting up? I look at her and I wink again. <laughs> No, Come I, small I one, we're hunting right. ghosts. I'm right, I just... I've just got my... And then he just uses his... um, what What is essentially just a table leg just to help himself get up and just poke his head in the door and see that there's nowhere to stand in the entranceway. Nope, there really isn't. <laughs> Alright, chat's back up. There we go. Oh, um, no, te- no, technically speaking, um... Since he's a small, technically small, would he be yeah. able to um, be in another person's space, or is that tiny? No, that's tiny. You have to be two sp- two yeah. sizes uh, two smaller. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Or is it yeah, just um, move him through squares? Uh well, both. Yeah. You can stay yeah. in someone's space if you're two sizes smaller. So, ah, okay, so it's two sizes. Small, not you can size. still squeeze through them to get inside. Yeah, it just takes five yeah. feet more of your movement. That's fine. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I'll give you guys a description of what you see in the house. First of all, there is a incessant ticking from somewhere. You don't know where that's from, but it seems to sort of emanate through the house. Um... The house itself has this sort of musty smell to it. Um, yeah, sorry, let me just try something here. That didn't work. There we go, that's better. And for some reason, You hear strange sounds just on the edges of your hearing. Sounds of some kind of chimes. Maybe the laugh of children. You're not quite sure where they come from. As if they come almost actually from everywhere. Strange clicking and... Sort of cracking noises. And you see that there is, in the midst of this space, a rather beautiful, but definitely downtrodden and web-coated staircase going up. You also see that there's a couple of doors here. There's a door over here to the east, a door to the north, a door to the northwest. Where do you want to go? Where was it you said you'd been? Um, he points to the north and he says, "We've been through there. That's the that's the parlor." You don't have any sort of plan for this. You're just going to wander around the house. No, no, of course not. We were we were planning on having you uh, observe the first floor or perhaps the second floor, and then uh, after you're done, we'll uh, begin the séance. Some strange music. <laughs> All right, then. I'm just going to throw open this door right here. All right. You open this door. I'm going to walk right in. All right, give me one second. And I will follow her. Not too closely, though. I'll move in further. There you go. There we go. Alright, 
one second here, folks. The handouts are falling apart, but I know I can fix that. You're having all kinds of technical. I know. It's scary. always on the days that you'd never really want it to happen that it happens. Whatever. It's fine. First session. We'll get those kinks out. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let me fix that. Oh, of course. I didn't think about this. This is an easier way of doing it. I have everything on my phone. <laughs> when all else fails, turn to your phone. That's the good thing about the smartphones. And these days, you can just do it on your phone. Mm-hmm. Ain't that the truth. I know this is stunning content, just watching me check the shit out on my phone. Hilarious. <laughs> there we go. Okay. As he checks something out on his phone, I'm going to flop down in this musty blue chair and say, Hello? Any ghosts? <laughs> Hello? Any ghosts? <laughs> uh, okay. Funny that you say that. <clears throat> um, I will give you a description. <laughs> okay, here we are. Yeah, uh, you're right now. You're actually in a um, in a room that is some kind of sitting room. As you flop down into this blue chair, it has three overstuffed chairs, and uh, I'd like you to roll a d twenty for me, please, Mui not. Mm. Which ghost do I get? An 11. Okay. Okay. Um, as you say, hello, any ghosts? Any, hello, any ghosts? Um, you hear a voice, a male voice. Kind of deep, actually. Um, and he says, What are you doing in my house? Sitting in your chair? Is this something we can all hear? Yeah, you all can hear okay. it. So I am most certainly going to draw my crossbow. Okay. <laughs> and yes, once again, I will fix chat. I'm looking around to see if I can figure out if there's anywhere in this room that voice could have come from. Uh, make a perception check for me. Eight. I'll just keep that there. Chat will stay there until I fix it for next time. Um, okay. Yeah, it seems to sort of bound all over the house, strangely enough. Interesting. Comfy chair, though. Very comfy chair. A little dusty, a little worm-ridden, so to speak. But mm. yeah, very nice chair. Very comfy. Cloud U, of course, comes in, looks around, says, No drinks here, I think. Anywhere else to go? I'm assuming, are there doors in this room anyway? There are. I'm sorry, I didn't point them out because they're sort of difficult to see, but we've got one here and one here, north and east. You do also happen to notice there is a, a, a one, perhaps of many, large fireplaces right here, right across from that lovely overstuffed chair. 
I suppose sitting rooms do happen to have. I'm assuming there is no fire in it, however. Oh, no. Nor seemingly has there been for a very long time. There are cobwebs all festooning this particular place. Uh, well, we have two doors. Pick your poison. Uh, I would like to check out this door. Okay. Uh, when you say check it out, are you looking for or are you just opening it? Just opening it and looking inside. Not going in. Sure. Um, okay. Um, I will leave that uh, room uh, to... Where is that? Come on. There we go. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll just open it. Uh, just a smidge then, shall I? Okay, you can spy from your viewpoint another set of a couple of comfy couple of different comfy chairs, shall I say. Um, overstuffed furniture, yeah. And uh, you're not quite sure, but like from your the corner of your vision, you see what looks to be some kind of a very large harp. Is that information relayed? Are you going to be enjoying that chair for a while? I mean, I assume I'll move eventually. Why? Well, you were playing a liar earlier, were you not? Indeed. Uh, there is a rather large harp in this room. I don't know if you play any other instruments, but... Well, a harp and a lyre aren't terribly different from one another. I'm certain I could give it a whirl. Do you open the door fully? Uh, sure. I'll just right. push the door open and then just step aside. <laughs> there you go. You push the door open with a creak. Um, and you are able to see that this room does, in fact, have a, a rather handsome concert harp dramatically sculpted with a flock of flying doves. Ooh, I am 100% gonna go play that harp. Okay. Also noted within this room there is another door directly to the north, right over here. Nice. Just gonna go walk uh, over assuming... and play it. It's about a oh, six I'm, foot I'm tall harp. Play the harp. Looks I'm like it's actually... Yeah, it, it's a beautiful harp. It's in fine condition as opposed to some of the other things that you've seen in this particular house. It looks as if it's been oiled regularly, actually. Not so make 20, a performance baby. check. Oh, it's perception. Oh, God damn it! Perception. <laughs> it's right you above see the harp very well. I know, it's, I a P, it's a P It's a P word. You can keep the 20, yeah. Then it's a 25. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. He's a bot. I'm a Bard, man. You are a bard. Okay, so as you three watch before your eye, before your eyes, uh, Moinot sits down at the small stool next to this harp and plays flawlessly a somewhat sort of moderato glass sharp tune that none of you have ever heard before. Sounds oddly like the theme to Game of Thrones. It does not. <laughs> and um Moinat, as you play this harp, your eyes sort of shut for a second. As if entranced by the music that you're playing. You know this song. You've played it before, but it sounds different from where you are. Or at least the realm that you're from. Hearing this music played in the open air is different than playing it under the waves. 
It sounds tinny and sharp. But somehow strangely beautiful. And I would like Amnestria and Mikmik, and I'll do it for Claudio, to make charisma saving throws, please. Oh, fun. That's gonna be. I knew this shit was gonna happen. I did it anyway. Saving throws, charisma, yay. Oh my god. <laughs> I'll do it for uh, for Claudio here. All right, 17. Very nice. Well, me remember, McMick's already young. Oh, yeah. Being charmed by more This is true. Play. This is true. This is true. Here we so go. This is for Claudio. Sense. Claudio, you got a 12. Okay. Every uh, man that you have used your powers on, shall I say, Muy not. You find this to be no different as Cloud You and um, and Mick Mick sort of wander into the room. Their eyes are glazed over and um, even Cloud You sort of like puts down his goblet almost completely drained, and they're just staring at you. Like, their eyes completely open, their mouths as well. And you can be sure that they are under your spell. This is giving you the ability to cast a man. But only right now, and only on these two. And Nestria, you watch. This has a beautiful tune, but it sort of made your head spin for a second. Um, you're okay now, but you watch as, as Claudio and Mikmik sort of shove past you, almost violently. And now they're standing in front of um, in front of this harp. What do you I say to them, Moynat? I look at the two of them for a moment. And I just say, sit. They both sit. Both they both of them sit on disparate chairs. I stand up and I chuckle to myself as I walk past them both, and I just kind of look from one to the other and say, "Oh, men are so predictable." Claudia sort of gets up, he like, shakes his head, he's like, what was, what was that? A little music. Let's step into the room. Oh, and ask. Oh, okay. Exactly what you just did to them. It's very... Nothing I haven't done before. Got a smile at her. I say, it's what I was made for, dear. It's what I'm best at. Ghosts, on the other hand, <sighs> not so much. Don't seem to be any in here. I'm gonna open this door. All right. Just actually, Tap would it work on an elf, seeing as a resistant to charm, or something? Like you that? don't know. Yeah, I don't know, but game-wise. Would that, that be right. classified as a charm? You don't know. It's command or charm? Command is uh, a form of charm, yes. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yep. But things work differently here. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, you opened the door. And Mick Mick's still just out of it. Yeah, Mick Mick, might, he might be taking a little bit longer of a time. Yeah. As, I, as I open the door, I kind of look down and I sort of snap my fingers in front of face, and I'm like, come on, small one. Things to do. Ghosts to find. I'm walking to this room that looks like a casino, but I'm betting it's a dining room. It is definitely not a casino. <laughs> <laughs> if it was, I think that would snap out Claudio pretty darn quickly. Yeah, if it's a casino, number one, that would definitely snap out, and number two, I think I'd be in the wrong module, to be honest. So. <laughs> Am I doing the right thing? Okay, yeah. So chairs and candelabras cover in dusty sheets. 
uh, attend to this hall's broad dining room table. Still life paintings depicting multiple grand feasts hang on the walls, their faded oils making the food look rotten. Why not? Please make a perception check. 18. Right. Under the table, you see a... Some, something? Someone? You're not quite sure. Um, covered in a... A white sheet. That's odd. Small. Maybe child-sized. I will reach down and pull the sheet off of whatever it is. The sheet spills out. And a hand grabs your wrist. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight. <laughs> nice. Of course we are. <laughs> Love it. Amazing. All right, I have to redo the uh, the zoom here because it looks like garbage here too. So here, let me just fix that quickly before we say goodnight. Excuse this, folks. Whenever you do uh, zoom and then you uh, lose someone, you have to redo the whole thing sometimes, and that's just the way it works. But that's okay because we go figure it out ASAP and fix it. So we can all say goodnight. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. I love you all. I know, okay. I know, I know. <laughs> it's cool. We had a cool first session, actually. Yeah. All right, we're getting there. I feel like Moynod's voice is going to keep changing until I settle into what it needs to be. That always happens. That always happens in every, um, in every game. You're not quite sure which accent every to game. use. Oh, Matt, in, we just in lost every, your voice. No, that's fine. There you go. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's just the push talk thing. So yeah, in almost every game, you're not quite sure like which accent to use. So yeah. it's kind of difficult to discern that. I'm chalking it up to the fact that she's not used to speaking as much above water. Only There speaking. you go. That idea. Yeah. All right. Fixed. We fix. It is fixed. All right. It is fixed. It is fixed. So, uh, that's it for our session number one of our wonderful Ravenloft campaign, which I am excited to do more of. So... Let's play the farewell music. This is new farewell music. We've gotten all this amazing Ooh. art and new farewell music. Here we go. Ooh. Look at that. Nice. So yeah, we'll say goodnight, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining on the first of Ravenloft Domain of... Domains of Dread, I should say. We're, we're going to be better at this. There's a little bit of technical snafus to always work oh, out in the beginning of every campaign. Me. Oh no! She dropped out before she was supposed to. <laughs> That's okay. I, a little bit too quick. Come back in. She'll, she'll come back I, and we'll all be in the and wrong And then I have to switch it around again. That's fine. We'll um, have to teach you how to do this, Maeve. It's totally cool. It's okay. Come back yeah, into Zul. Nah, no, it's fine. It's Try. fine. You're good. Um, in the meanwhile, while Maeve is coming back, we will uh, switch it to, um, I guess, uh, to... Well, well, I mean, we actually we actually did this at the beginning. We actually said well, where we're going to do. But at the end of every session, we'll always just talk about where you can find each other on the internet and all that other jazz. Oh, there's Maeve. There she goes. Boom. Come on back, Maeve. Working on it. I don't hey, know about that. Uh, uh, Maeve. And then we just need a face. You can turn your camera on, and we're ready to go. There we go. Yay! <laughs> Maeve, Maeve's, uh, Maeve's, you know what, Maeve, I gotta be honest with you. This is like your first time streaming, which I'm super happy about that. Um, with us, anyway. And uh, you're, you're really good at it. And uh, everybody gets better and better and better. Trust me, when we did this for the first time, 
God knows what the hell happened. It was just, you know, it took a lot of effort. <laughs> so, but we thank you guys in the stream for for uh, helping along uh, the interesting yeah, stuff that's going those on. Desk ones. Oh, yes. All those tarot deck reads, uh, we're going to get better at those too. As well as potentially others. I don't want to make it the rule set too complicated that we're always juggling stuff around. Uh, uh, less is more, as they say. But until next time, folks. Uh, oh, by the way, that, that won't spooky, change. Something spooky happened? Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, hello? Did something spooky happen? Of course something spooky yeah. happened. I guess it depends on what your version of spooky is. Like lightning yeah. that drops you to the ground or, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, want, I was wondering if that was the quote-unquote spooky thing that was redeemed in chat. You, you're, uh, you know, dealer's choice, as they say. <laughs> uh, uh, spooky, oh, oh, I don't know, like some creepy shit, like that, that guy under the table. How about that? That's pretty sp spooky. That's so. pretty creepy. That's classic jump scare creepy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's it, it for uh, tonight, folks. Thanks very much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again next week. More Ravenloft, Domains of Dread. Until then, remember, take care of each other. But don't remember, forget to take care of we're back on Thursday. Of, oh, that's right. We're back on Thursday with um, Star Wars 5v. And then Friday for more Ravenloft. So, remember, take care of each other, but don't forget to take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching, folks. Have a great night and a great weekend. And Bye. later.